purpose of this talk is to discuss an area in an overall field called generative testing. Rather than write out all your tests one by one and then maybe miss an edge case or miss some exceptional circumstance, the tool that I'm going to use, the one called jQuick, is a Java library that allows you to define properties. When I have this class, this should be true at all times. And it will generate, the default is a thousand test cases for you. And you could increase that number and decrease it. It will generate the tests at random. It will cover the space that you ask it to cover, which could be infinite, it could be constrained, it could be everything. And it's a really useful library. Now, it's still under development after a bit of a hiatus. It, it got to a point where it was quite stable. And the developer, the, this is one of those open source projects where the like 70 to 80 percent of the commits were all done by one developer, you know, the owner of the project. And then he got pulled onto other things after a while. But he's back and he's filed some funding requests to move the library forward. So I'm using this library because it's, of the ones I've seen, this is by far the best one in Java. But property-based testing has been well established in other languages for quite some time. In fact, there's Haskell libraries that are quite mature on this. Okay, first things first, uh, there's my contact information. Uh, my name is Ken Cousin. It's pronounced like the relative. It just doesn't look like it, you know. There's my homepage, blog, Twitter handle for, well, how long is Twitter going to be around? Another couple of days, maybe? Uh, what's Elon done today, you know? At any rate, uh, I'm also on Mastodon. And every Sunday, I put out a free weekly newsletter called Tales from the Jar Side, hosted on Substack. And I have a companion YouTube channel for the same thing. Uh, those are the books that were mentioned, but let me move on. OK, so most people, if you've ever used a tool like JUnit, and basically everybody in the Java world sooner or later uses JUnit, you're quite familiar with example-based testing. This is where you specify the inputs and what the output should be, and then you check to see if, the, if that passed or not. The problem with that is that it's difficult to make sure you've covered all the possibilities. Edge cases, unusual values, repeated values, all sorts of weird stuff that just doesn't occur to you because then it starts becoming tedious. And once testing becomes tedious, people don't want to do it anymore. So this is the idea of property-based testing. And I'm going to get into more of the theory in a minute, but let me just go right into the code here. Now, before I forget, and I have this in the slides here, but I have a GitHub repository that has all this code in it uh, some of this code is borrowed from various sources. I tried to label each class that way. I just wanted a place to put it so I could run it and then added my own. So I've got it in GitHub under the account that's under my last name, K-O-U-S-E-N. The repository is called uh, PBT for peanut butter, I'm sorry, property-based testing. I keep seeing peanut butter testing. I can't stop. Anyway, PBT underscore jQuick. And notice jQuick spelled a little oddly, J-Q-W-I-K, but there it is. So uh, if I add any more cases, I will push them to the repository as soon as we're done or, you know, this evening, something like that. Um, and if you, if you see anything that you, in there that you're not happy about or you're interested or you have questions about, just let me know. So you've got all my contact information and there's the repository. Now, one of the tests that's that's going to start us off is from a blog by Johannes Link. Now, Johannes Link is the developer who's the head of the project. So when he created the project, he created a series of blog posts. I think there's five or six in the main sequence discussing how property-based testing works and more specifically, how he was going to apply it to Java. And I took the first test he did and he said, well, let's do property-based testing on a list only because everybody already knows how lists work. They're quite familiar with it. So now this starts off as a standard example-based test. So this is not property-based test. He said, and again, I'll show you the code. I just took it directly from his uh, blog post. He made a list with the elements one, two, and three. He called collections.reverse, which reverses the order of the elements in the specified list. And then 
just asserts that the list contains exactly the numbers in reverse order. That, by the way, is an example of a search A, the testing library search A, which I'm glad to see he likes. I'm fond of it, too. Uh, if you haven't seen a search A, the spring people are very fond of it, which was what Clint, you know, that was kind of the deciding factor for me to start going into that. I mean, so you wouldn't be at all surprised to see that if I ran that test alone, that runs just fine. There's nothing actually to see yet. Now, this is the idea of a property-based test. The property that we're going to say, the thing that must be true before and after the method, if we're going to do a reverse, then reversing the reverse of the list should be the original list. When we apply the reverse method twice, we should get back the original. Now, the reverse method is below here. This is the one that he suggested in his blog post, and I'll show you an alternative in a minute. So the reverse takes a list as an argument, makes an array list, and clones the, the uh, rather, this is um, making an array list with the original as an argument, called it a clone, then invokes reverse and returns that list, and then the question is, will that work? And then here is the quick, jQuick part. For all is an annotation. And this is used on everywhere. I mean, that's probably the first annotation you'll deal with other than this one, at property. At property is what identifies this as a property-based test rather than an example-based test. And notice, I don't have to do anything special to tell the framework that I'm using a property-based test. I don't have to use a particular runner or extension or anything like that. This was designed to work with JUnit. So I say property, and what they say down here is the, use that property to mark the methods that serve as properties, and they usually have one or more parameters annotated with for all. Now, for all is used on all sorts of fields, but the one here says for all lists of string, list of type string. Then we call reverse on reverse of the original and see if it's equal to the original. That for all means it's going to generate a thousand cases at random, populate them with strings, and then call this. But it will include edge cases, like there'll be an empty string or there'll be an empty list, I should say, etc. So here's the reverse method. Let me run this and show you what you get. And we're actually not going to see a lot, but let's see if I can move that over. So there's a timestamp and everything, and it says it tried a thousand cases, and they all passed. They were random, not randomized parameters inside there. Now they do report the seed on the random number generator, and this is really important because if we got a failure and we want to use the same set of value tests again, then we need the seed, and that we can we can use that. Uh, there were only a few edge cases and everything, so not a lot of information, but that's because this passed. It was not a problem at all. Okay, now, one thing I can do right off the bat, again, they talk about this in the documentation. There's an annotation here called at report. And report will specify additional things to be reported when running a property. They have uh, an, an enum here called reporting which has uh, falsified it's the ones that failed and generated. Let me show you what this looks like. And you see this is a lot of information inside here. And you find out this is showing every one of the generated test cases. And when they said for all list of string, they meant strings spanning the entire Unicode system. Okay, so it's always a surprise to me the first time I do this to see Oh yeah, US ASCII, which is what I'm accustomed to, is a tiny fraction of what's available in Unicode. Now there are other annotations as well. I don't have to just live with strings. I can say ASCII strings or I could confine them in some other way. But you know, see if I go through this whole thing, you'll see there are literally a thousand of them here. Let's see if I could just drag that down until I get the same answers at the bottom. And they are varying lengths on the list as well. OK, so let me uh, stop it from doing that now. OK, now, you can test on explicit lists of integers, but the reverse method should satisfy this property. The reverse of the reverse of a list should return the original list. So this is functioning under what we call preconditions and postconditions. 
or what we used to call programming by contract. Programming by contract has been around for decades, but it never really caught on in the Java world. The traditional definition of programming by contract is that each method has pre and post conditions, and the way you explain those is post condition, a post condition is a Boolean that must be true on exit, but only if the preconditions are satisfied. These Booleans are true on entry. The classic example is a stack calling a pop method. What's true after you complete the pop method is there's one less item on the stack, or one fewer item on the stack. I guess fewer, at any rate. But that's only true if the stack wasn't empty. See? So you need the preconditions to be true in order for the post conditions to be true. And if you do have the preconditions true and the post conditions fail anyway, that's where you're supposed to get an exception. Java doesn't do that. Java doesn't have pre and post conditions in the language, so they use exceptions for precondition checks. If you call pop on an empty stack, you get an empty stack exception. Which again, it's a violation of the theory here, but that's what we've been living with. At any rate, this one basically says, if you can give me these conditions that must be true, it will generate 1,000 random cases that cover the test space and give you those examples. So this link here, which I put in the slides from Johannes Link's blog, is that first step. Uh, just a minute. It is here. This is the first step in that sequence. And then there is that test I was just showing you. He, now, I got to tell you. One of the purposes this is good for, one of the things that this is really useful for, is if you acquire code from a third party resource, okay? So you're not sure where it works and where it doesn't. Where are the boundaries on it? They say they've tested it and hopefully they've given you the test, but you, you want to be sure. Then property based testing becomes very helpful because you could just say, well, let's test this for all integers for all doubles in a range. Here's a min and a max. There's lots of characteristics you could put in there. So for example, I decided, all right, let's, let's be silly about this. I went to chat GPT. Uh, I keep trying to magnify, it doesn't want to. So at any rate, I said, um, I said hey, chat GPT, reverse a list using streams instead of the constructor and collections.reverse. And it said, sure, you can do that. And it gave me code that if you spend two minutes looking at this, you'll realize it's completely wrong. I mean, what this is going to produce is a, a list that is in reverse of the natural order. <laughs> it's trying to sort them at, by the reverse of the natural order, collector. And it also did this. Uh, this one right here, array list collections dot reverse order. That doesn't that doesn't exist. That's a constructor that takes a collector. There are no array list constructors that take a collector. So I looked at this and I said, you know, and it tries to explain to me that why it's right. I mean, and I said, do you realize that won't work at all? And I tried to tell it, you know, this is wrong. This isn't right. That we you'll get back the wrong answer. And it said, yeah, you're correct. I apologize. Here it is again which is basically the same thing, exactly, you know? So I figured, all right, this is a nice demo to show you the thing failing. So this is the chat GPT one. Let me uncomment it. So I simplified it slightly, but that's the idea. Take the original list, make it a stream, sort it in reverse of the natural order, which is not a reverse sort, you know? And then down here is my property and the for all, et cetera. So let me run this test that calls that. And what you'll see are a couple of really interesting features. So first of all, it fails. Good. It only took one try <laughs> to fail immediately. And here is that failure, the arguments on the list. It made a list of size two where the elements were zero and one, and it failed. But that's not really what it did. What it really did is it started with this sample. You see this list with all these elements in it? One of the things that's a really nice feature of jQuick is it does what they call shrinking. It will find an error 
and then it will progressively try to make the input smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it doesn't get the error anymore. It tries to find out what was the minimum size and the minimum values that gave the same error. So it actually hit this one with an error, which apparently was the first thing it tried, you know, which, sure, that makes sense. And then it shrank it down to 0, 1. And if I add extra annotations, I can actually watch the steps where it went through that process. But that's a really valuable mechanism, you know, that shrinking mechanism like that, so that you don't have to, uh, that you don't have to figure it out yourself. Now the other thing jQuick will do is if I was to try to run again, I'm gonna get a random sample again, and maybe I won't get that same sample. No, jQuick remembers its most recent failure and includes that failure in the next sample. So it will remember that as well. It does try to prioritize. So it's not completely random. It's mostly random. But it's trying to prioritize edge conditions and other things that might cause trouble, including the most recent failure inside there. Let me comment that one out again so it doesn't break. Now, in the blog, he says, we just reversed the list of integers. Can we use generics? And he put in a wild card with a question mark, and of course that works. And then he says, all right, let's uh, say we're going to join two lists. We're going to take a list and we're going to add, add all to take, take the first list and add all from the second list and put them together. And then the question is, and this is what you always have to figure out, what's my property? What's invariant? What's going to be true afterwards? And he said, in this case, the size of the join list will be equal to the sum of the sizes of the two individual lists, which makes sense. Of course, that wouldn't work on a set where you don't have duplicates. But on a list, it would be fine. And again, you just throw that in there, and that should pass without an issue. Yeah, 1,000 runs without an issue. That's fine. Here, I threw in one to do basic stream calculations, just to show the streaming stuff works too. So this is another property which is commutative sorting and filtering. If I sort a list and then filter it, do I get the same resulting list as if I filter it and then sort it? Now the performance is gonna be different, right? I mean, you'd rather filter and then only sort what makes it through the filter. But the actual output should be the same. If I'm not concerned about the performance, I just want to see if that output works, then here's a stream where I provided a list, and I sort it, and I filter it for just the even numbers, and then convert it to a list. And here I do the same thing with the filter and the sort reversed, and assert that the sort when then filter is equal to the filter and then sort, and sure enough, that one passes as well. I think, yeah, see, he didn't do that. He had his own sort where he's trying to use the assorted method. At any rate, I just rewrote it that way. So I want to show you some of those basics there. Now, let me go back to the slides for a moment. You define a property, and then jQuick has two mechanisms to allow you to generate samples to try to test that property. One of the mechanisms I've been showing you is those annotations. And there's a lot more. The other mechanism is that there is actually a class called arbitraries, plural, that has a bunch of static methods in it that allow you to get much more detailed than, maybe that's not quite true. I was going to say than, than the annotations would. And that's probably true, but there may be things I can do with the annotations that I'm not aware of. You know what I mean? There may be extra things. But let me give you an idea. Now, first of all, where's, the, where's this located? The library is located at jquick.net. That's the home page for it. It's based on a Haskell library called QuickCheck. And again, they emphasize you can't prove that a property is ever correct. You could just look for counterexamples. That's what this is doing, searching for counterexamples for all of these. And the big one I mentioned, at property and at for all, we're going to use all the time. Now, by the way, at for all allows you to specify the number of, of examples you want. Now, what you do when you write your test is either you put the actual assertions right inside the test, or you make the method, the test method, return a Boolean. And it'll check that Boolean to see if that's correct or not. So you could do it either way. Whichever is more comfortable is a more natural way of doing it. From, with my history with JUnit, 
I tend to do the assertions right in the test and have them return void just because I'm used to it. But I've also spent a lot of time in the Groovy ecosystem and then Groovy, the last evaluated expression is returned automatically and I'm used to that too. So either way, it's perfectly fine. Okay, I told you about the at report annotation as well. Now, the, again, about the generated values, smaller values are generated more frequently than larger values too, which is, again, not obvious and interesting, but it does try to do border cases like empty strings and empty lists and min and max values as well. The generated values are available for all primitives, all the wrapper classes as well, so you don't have to stick to one or the other. It also works for big integer and big decimal. Now, of course, it's going to be infinite, but we can restrict that. Strings, there's lots of restrictions you could put on it. Enum types, of course, as well as list, set, stream, and even optional. It will generate optional values as well, as long as the type that you're wrapping is something it knows how to generate. Now, if it's a class, and therefore it doesn't have a built-in generator, we have a way to do that too, but use, for that you don't use the annotation approach, you use the arbitraries. So I'll show you an example of that in a minute. It can handle arrays, it can handle maps, and in the documentation, it says it can't do some of the types from java.time. Yeah, it can. I mean, it, by now it has. It hadn't updated the documentation. The library does work with that. So, for example, uh, I have a class where I was just using it as a catch-all called um, property tests, property-based tests here. And here, for example, is, where is it? I have to search on it. It was my local time, or local date. Okay, here's an example of testing local dates. So I say, let's generate local dates with the annotation. So again, property-based, I'm using void, so there's an assertion in here. For all, and then there's ranges. So date range says constrain the range of generated date parameters in the format of ISO local dates, applies to local date time, instant, offset date time, all the major date and time properties or classes in uh, java.time. So um, date range with a min of, and that's January 1st of 2019 in the ISO standard string format. And then max is the end of 2020, and I'm just saying I'm generating local dates. Then I assert that the local date is between, et cetera, just like it looks. And again, you won't be surprised to see that that, that passes without an issue. Uh, interestingly enough, it only tried 731. It started off with 1,000 test cases, and a lot of the random ones didn't fit between the min and max. And therefore, we only wound up with 731 in the end. I could put a reporting on there and find out which ones were actually tested, but I generally feel like, yeah, it probably covered it, you know, <laughs> probably okay there. But you can adjust that and it will tell you how many it ran exactly there. So you can do local dates without a problem. So here are some of those constraining annotations that you could use. At string length will let you look for strings of exactly a particular length not empty and not blank. The difference is, is that blank strings cannot consist only of white space, but empty strings can't. So you can pick whichever one you prefer. And you can put multiple ones, as you saw, you could chain several of these together in your argument list. Uh, characters or character range as well, numeric or alpha, or when I didn't specify on my strings, I got all of Unicode. So I could just say alpha characters, and that would have stuck with strings that I might actually recognize, something like that. Lowercase, uppercase, and also white space. And we'll get to that in a moment as well. Uh, size works on both collections and arrays as well. Uh, not empty works on collections. And then you saw I used a local, or date range rather. There's also ranges for all the primitives as well as big range. <laughs> which works for both big integer and big decimal, interestingly enough. And of course, there's positive and negative ones like that as well. OK, so here is where we say, that's not good enough. What if I want more detail? I want to constrain this. So one of the examples that Johannes Link has in his blog post is to say, we want to check German zip codes for what it's worth. 
So this time he says for all, and the argument to for all is the name of a method that's going to return the values. And that method will use the arbitraries class to generate it. So over here, so that was uh, zip codes. So here is the property, which looks like it's doing nothing, but it's got for all German zip codes as a string and nothing inside it. And then here is the, is the method that generates them. You see how this is property, but this is provide. Used to annotate methods that can provide values for the property method parameters, and they use arbitrary. So this is, I usually write it vertically just to make it a little easier to read. So this is saying, I'm dealing with strings. So you see there are factory methods for strings and all the other primitive types as well, and so on. With character range, so here I'm putting in 0 to 9, of length 5. So I didn't know, but apparently German zip codes are 0 to 9 of length 5, strings. I come from the state of Connecticut uh, in the United States. If you know roughly where New York City is and roughly where Boston is, we're about halfway in the middle. Zip codes are... a a touchy topic for us sometimes because a beginner programmer, nobody in here obviously, but a beginner programmer might use an integer type for a zip code in the US and our zip codes start with a zero, okay? So they, they come out octal, it's a mess. So at any rate, this is at least using strings and that's good. So to actually show this, let me run that and you will see Again, I'm not reporting on the actual values at the moment, but I could just by putting the at report generated and then run it again. And there are the zip codes being generated. There's the 00000, 000, 000 99999, and then all the ones that are randomly distributed in that sequence. Okay? You can combine these arbitrary constraints so that if you make a German zip code and you make some other constraint, you can actually combine them together and declare it as something else. And what this is really useful for is it allows you to, to invoke a constructor on a class. This is really different. I didn't anticipate this. So I have a class here. Again, well, he has a class. I borrowed I modified it from his blog post. His class was a POJO plain old Java object. I made it a record. Okay, so here's my record called person. Takes a first name and a last name as a string. In the braces, I added in a full name method that concatenate the two together with a space on it. Now that's not a good design, especially because, you know, a lot of people don't have a first name or a last name. I just have one or you have many, but whatever. I just wanted to demonstrate the process. Now, if you had never used records before, Here's your 30 seconds on records. Records are immutable. They cannot be modified. You instantiate them. The constructor goes before the braces. That's called the primary constructor. You could add secondary constructors, but then they have to delegate to the primary. They have to call this with the primary. The methods inside the record can use the values, but cannot modify them. Your getters don't use the word get. In other words, the accessors for this would be first name as a, with parentheses and last name with parentheses, right? And they automatically generate to string equals and hash code. They're like Lombok at data classes, but they're immutable. And the getters have a different naming convention. So at any rate, here's my test case for this guy. And again, it's not my test. I borrowed it, but I did modify it. So any valid person has a full name. So for all, valid person, and that's going to be my provider, the way that I generate the combination of first name and last name. And this says for all persons, but I have to provide a way to create a person. And all I'm going to do here in the property is check that the length of the full name is greater than or equal to 5, which is a weird constraint, but again, he picked it in the blog post. So this time I'm not giving him credit, I'm giving him blame. You know, but. So here's the valid person, and you're returning an arbitrary of the type you want. So this is going to be starting off with first name using arbitraries, plural, dot string. So there's your factory method. 
in the character range of all lowercase for some reason, of min length two and max length 10. Again, these are, have to come from your business logic. And then map it to uppercase for some reason. And then this is a totally separate arbitrary to make the last names that have a min length of two and a max length of 20 and are not in uppercase. And then you say combine them, and you see that's the order they're in in the constructor, and say as person colon colon new, the constructor reference. That's a method reference for a constructor. So it will take the first name, last name combination and add it to instantiate the person class. And that should work. Now if I go and, first of all, I'll run it just to make sure it's going to pass. And it does. I mean, not a big surprise. I mean, I wouldn't have put it in there. He wouldn't have put it in there if it didn't. Let me put in the report then as well. Just to, whoop, not there, here. And you can see there's the first name and last names in there. I was hoping in the right near the beginning I'd see some min sizes. Well, yeah, there's a two character first name. Etc. This isn't going to have any nulls or because of the limits that were placed on it, there's not going to be any weird edge cases in there. But you can, again, look at them if you want. So that's how you can go and create instances of classes. But I got to tell you, when you start playing with this thing, here's something to keep in mind. This property-based test stuff works great for stateless methods. In fact, if you're using pure functions, the outputs are always the same for the same inputs and no side effects. This is great for that. So the idea was, I think part of the reason, I, now I don't know Johannes Link. I sent him some email telling him what complimenting him on the library, but I don't know him, so I don't know that this is what happened. I suspect part of the reason that this didn't catch on in a big way when he first released it is that functional programming in Java wasn't a big thing yet. It, it was even before Java 8. And therefore, it was like, yeah, this is nice, but everything we do is stateful. It just didn't seem to fit OO as much. Now that we spend so much time doing functional coding, and not only that, we even have functions as a service, you know, AWS Lambda and all of those things. This is ideal for that kind of stuff. Can you do stateful testing with this? Yes, but it gets increasingly awkward. It's, it's difficult. You generally want to find a workaround that caches some values so that it's not stateful. Or there is a way, and he talks about creating a state machine and evolving from thing to thing. And like, oh man, it's really ugly. I, I'm not interested. You know what I mean? But if you're dealing with stateless functions, and if you're especially dealing with pure functions, this is great. It's really, really useful for that. Okay. I mentioned this, but here it is in the slides. Every time you run, you're going to get a different set of random values. So the output does show the seed, and that becomes an argument to the at property annotation if you want to reproduce the same values again. So seed equals, you just put in whatever it was, and then you'll get the same values again on that. Now this is that process called shrinking. Shrinking says, we got an error, but that error may not be terribly informative to you. So that jQuick will try to progressively shrink the, the input down to the simplest possible value that still fails. And sometimes it's not obvious, but jQuick does make a really good stab at it. it. It's the sort of thing that we would have to do ourselves if the library didn't do it for us. So that's really nice. So then the challenge becomes finding properties. Now rather than go through that right now, let me show you a typical example of when I would use this sort of thing. Okay, I was reading a blog post about encryption and somebody mentioned the old famous Caesar cipher. Anybody familiar with the Caesar cipher? Yeah, I figured there'd be some people, definitely. Probably, you know. <laughs> Or Caesar, maybe Caesar was having salad when he came up with the cipher. Maybe it's that direction. Yeah, best I can come up with. But I knew you were going to reply. At any rate, um, by the way, go to go to Rob's talks. They're really good. Um, the idea was is that Julius Caesar supposedly during the campaigns in Gaul had to have a way to send messages to and back from his generals. And you're dealing with a largely illiterate populace in general, so you didn't have to worry too much about the codes being broken. But that is supposedly where they came up with the first cipher. And the idea was is you write out the alphabet, and then you write it down right below and shift it 
by a certain amount of numbers. It's just a modulo operation, basically. But the thing was, is they'd made these cylinders and you could wrap the alphabet around it and just shift it like that. And therefore, you had it encoded by shifting it forward and decoded by shifting it back. It's a, a shared key cryptography mechanism, the simplest possible one. A somewhat more sophisticated Caesar cipher would be to use a keyword and put that in front, like G-I-D-S, and then use the rest of the alphabet without those letters in, and that becomes your shared key again. But interestingly enough, I mean, it's, it's totally useless nowadays. I mean, you could write a program that would take two seconds or less to break any possible Caesar cipher. But I was reading this post, and they actually wrote code to do a Caesar cipher. Now, this site, Beldung, you know, they, they usually have interesting blog posts. And sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're OK. It depends on who you're reading. And there was an algorithm implemented for this, and it looked really complicated. And I thought, OK, this is one with a natural property. The property is, if I encode it and then I decode it, I should get back the same thing I started with, right? The decode should be the opposite of the encode. So I went to, at the bottom here, is the link to the uh, GitHub repository with a code in it. And I grabbed the code. So here's the code from them. I didn't do much to it. I made some slight modifications. Uh, but there's the letters are from A to Z, and all they had, and this is the, the code, and you could read it if you want. I didn't, didn't even think it was worth it. But there's the cipher method, that's the encode method, and here's the decipher method, which is the decode, and he had some other things in about breaking the cipher, and that's what I, I didn't care about. So here's the test, and this is what I found appalling. Once you know about property-based testing, when you see example testing that's completely inadequate, you go, wait a minute, that's not good. So what he did, and if you look at the code, is he made a sentence. He told me I could never teach a llama to drive. Okay, and then wrote in what that sentence looks like shifted by three characters, and the sentence shifted by 10 characters, and said, there's my test cases. So the test that was provided was, I'll take that sentence and shift it by three and see that it's the one that I provided, and I'll shift it by 10, and that's fine, and I'll even shift it by 36 and see if that wraps around to be 10, you know, modulo 26. And that's where he left it, and I'm like, that's not enough, you know? I mean, where's your edge cases? Where's your non-ASCII values? Everything. So what I added at the bottom, let's see, was the property for all. Now, uh, first of all, let me break it, and then I'll, I'll make it work again. So let me take out uh, all those qualifiers. For all strings, and for all, and I'll pick this int range for a reason I'll get to in a moment. Let's encode it with that offset, and then decipher it and see that that's the same as the original. So let me run that. And I've already got problems. And again, I'm already in a problem of what the heck is that character? It's a non-printable character. It's tiny little text that says NUL on it. And said, yeah, that didn't work. And here's one with a diamond with a question mark, which basically means I don't have the font. I can't render it. And then there is whatever that is, and on and on. And I'm like, OK, that's not going to be helpful. Let me put the constraints back in and show you what I had to wind up adding. First of all, the lowercase, because I didn't read the blog post closely enough. It actually did say they only did it for lowercase. OK, that was my fault. So I added in the lowercase. And then char is here with an empty space, although I think I could have added white space instead. But you could use, I want to illustrate the extra characters. So not just characters, but also white space in there. Now, let me take out the, oh, and not blank. I definitely want a character inside there. Now, let me take out the int range. So this is for all integers. And I'll run it again. And now I got an error 
uh, cannot generate the random falsified status. Uh, expected a B, but was it shifted into capital letters? So I wound up with a problem right inside there. And that was uh, the original one was, that's the shrunk sample. There's the original on that argument, something like that. So now what basically is happening, let me put, undo this before I forget, is I think we ran into a shift. Now, first of all, this is totally ridiculous, right? Nobody would do a shift more than 26. If there's 26 letters, that's it or however many letters of the length of the alphabet. But this tried to go all the way to max int, and we wound up in weird places in the Unicode character set. So I had to keep restricting the max until I found the value where, okay, now I know where the limit is for the shift on this. Now again, it's a silly problem. I mean, who's gonna shift like that? But that's what jQuick can do for you. It can show you where the limits are. When I started off with this one, oh, I already had something here, I have it disabled. For all non-blank strings, for all positive integers, this one would fail, and then this was the combination that turned out to work. The point is, I was able to take a third person, a third party set of code, and figure out where it was applicable, where it worked for me. Another related example, by the way, back in the property-based tests, is the idea of URL encodes and URL decodes. You would think that if I use a URL encoder and then wrap that in a URL decoder, I'm gonna get back what I started with. The thing is, is that I can give it the string, but there's also the possibility of a character set. Now here I wrote, again, disabled, yet yeah, note this fails, just to let you know. I said, okay, for all strings of min length one and max length 20, and for all character sets, and char set here is my method down here that goes to the, the char set class or char set class, however you say it, java.newio.char set. It's like, okay, there's all the available character sets as a key set and convert that to, uh, to an array. I, I rather, what I did is I got that collection and this populates a string array of it. So I start off with the set, because that's what the method returns, and then convert it to an array of strings, and now I have an arbitrary of type string. So when I run this, you're gonna see that you would think encode and decode reversible, and this was as long as, oh no, sorry, that's the wrong one. Here's the one. Let me run this one. And the, the problem was the big five Encoding scheme, whatever that is, turns out to be an issue. Uh, ISO 8859-8, I didn't know that was gonna be a problem. I would have thought, that, actually, don't we use ISO 8859-1, I think? You know, so I don't know what the dash eight is, but in other words, there are some character sets here where they just go, I, you know, not gonna work. So what I did was, is I said, well, all right, all I'm really interested in is UTF-8. And then I put in my min and max, if you will, and that works just fine. So again, you see the purpose of jQuick is to help you find out where these functions are applicable, where you can trust them to be coming up with something good, because that's a really hard bug to find, right? That would be really tough trying to diagnose that one. Okay. Oh yeah, let's look at a couple other possible errors. Who would have guessed absolute value of all numbers is positive? I mean, seriously, if you go math.abs on an integer, that should be greater than or equal to zero, right? Well, no, because min, that's min integer, integer dot min value. And you know that the, because zero is included in the integers, it's asymmetrical. We go from min value to max value minus one. Well, it's two to the th minus, two to the 31st. Okay, let me say it right. Minus two to the 31st, up to two to the 31st minus one. And this failure is minus two to the 31st. So when they took the absolute value of it, it came out positive or negative or something or whatever it was, it didn't return the right value. In other words, math. In other words, math dot abs has an issue at the boundary. And who knew? I didn't realize that, but now I do. 
Okay, so that's an interesting one. Now this one was uh, length of the concatenated string is greater than the length of each of the individual ones. So this was trying to do what he did the same way. And yeah, I, I can already see what the issue is in this one. Can you see what the issue is? Why? Well, let me make it fail and then you'll know immediately. So I've got the concatenated string is just using a plus and I assert that the length of the result is greater than the first one and also greater than the second one. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, you see, let me run it and I'll show you. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I didn't account for zero length strength because it really needs to be a greater than or equal to. So expecting the actual to be zero and it was to be greater than zero, and you'll see that they started off with two empty strings, or that's the one they shrunk it down to. It was actually this little string here and an empty string, and that's what failed because I needed to be doing an equality check and not just a greater than check. So again, very clear once you've seen it, or once you see it. Uh, this was another one from him. List of strings, the first character of which must be unique. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting choice? So for all strings of size max 25, we're going to say they're unique by first character dot class, and first character is an inner class made down here. A static inner class that is a function of all things with an apply method that just returns the character as. So a function is single value in, single value out. The value coming in is the string. The value coming out is the character at the first position. I don't know why we used object, but that's what he did. So here I'm saying the unique elements by that. So the first character ought to be unique. And I'm only interested in alpha characters of string length min 1, max 10. Now notice the syntax here is a little different. The one before I used for all, at for all list. This is list at alpha characters inside the, the uh, angle brackets to put the constraint on the string, not on the list. That's the idea. So when we run this one, I think that actually passes. Yeah, on that one. Okay, I, can, I don't, that doesn't show anything we didn't do before, except to show you that in your arbitraries, you know, short strings here, there's arbitrary strings with character range of min length, of max length. Likewise, with integers, this is a supplier that provides integers between 10 and 99. You know, so you could constrain things that way as well. And the rest we've seen. Okay, so that was that one. Now, how do you come up with these properties? That's usually the challenge when looking at property-based testing. One suggestion that he put in his blog was business rules. For all customers with last year's sales volume above 5,000 euros, we'll provide an additional discount of 5% if the invoice's total amount is equal or above 500 euros or something. You can see, once you get to know the API, that translates rather easily into those arbitraries methods. You could put in the min and the max and the, the customer you know, sales volume and some kind of probably an integer, you know, and there, therefore it's easy to put in there. Uh, inverse functions is the one that seems to be the most natural for me. That's the easiest one to come up with. That's the decode ought to be the reverse of encode. Reverse, re reverse should be the original. Uh, actually, uh, idempotent functions, weird word. Idempotent, we, we encounter in RESTful Web Services all the time. The idea is that we do something that doesn't change the value. And here they're saying a sort of a sorted list should leave it unchanged. So if you already have it sorted and you sort again, it should be the same. Now you may notice in the Java sorts, they are what they call, um, oh, what's the term for it? Ordered, I think, or no, it's not ordered. The idea is that they take values that are equal by the sorting condition and leave them in the order they encountered them. And there's a term for that, and I'm blanking on it. You, you know the term for that, right? No? Um, where's my sort here? I don't think it's lazy. Uh, it's, there's actually a term. Oh, here, it's in the sorted method. Um, the elements are not compared, or stable, they, they call it stable. So for ordered streams, the sort is stable, meaning that any element that's equal by the comparator stays in the place you found it. 
you know, elements that were equal stay relatively the same position. That I think would be necessary in order for sort of a sort to stay the same, so they don't move around the ones that are equal, you know. But that works too. Um, invariant functions, of course, things that always return the same value. Uh, commutativity, you know, so I have an example where you, you well, I showed you the, the filter, then sort, followed by the sort, then filter. There's something called a test oracle, which presumably has something to do with the, you know, with the owner of the Java ecosystem. No, I'm not going there. Uh, that was not a good joke. Didn't work at all, did it? At any rate, um, I was making an oracle joke. The company, not, you know. No, I know what the joke should have been. Something about lawyers, right? Test Oracle, but would insist that you did it exactly their way. You can't use the word Java in any combination of case. Is that what it is? There it is. OK. At any rate, um, some things are hard to compute, but easy to verify. There was an example that I think I have in there of a finding the, the, the ratio phi, the golden ratio. And there is an approximation to the golden ratio involving square root of five and all this weird stuff. And there's algorithms for computing the golden ratio. And what you can do is, is find out, let it calculate the golden ratio with your algorithm, but you actually have an approximation and see how good that approximation is. D does it work for all values? Does it tail off after a point? Where's your limitation on it? That sort of thing. Uh, induction, that's an old gag. Uh, you know the, the prime number test? Um, the te I mean, we're getting at the end of the day. You know, the gags are okay, hopefully. Uh, one question math test. Prove or disprove that all the odd numbers are prime? Have you heard this? The mathematician goes, well, three is prime and five is prime, and therefore by induction, all the odd numbers are prime. You know, the more math you know, the funnier that one is. The physicist says three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, oh, nine. Well, that could be experimental error. 11 is prime, 13 is prime, that's got to be enough. Uh, the engineer says three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine is prime, 11 is prime, 13 is prime. You know. The computer scientist? Three is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime, five is prime. And the manager? Two is prime, four is prime, six is prime, eight is prime. Yeah, there you go. At any rate, I always think of that with the proof by induction one there. So feel free to reuse that gag if you can. And then they get to the idea of stateful testing, which, as I say, is kind of uh, awkward and a mess. Now, on the home page of the phys, uh, I'm sorry, on the home page of jQuick, the first example they show you is good old FizzBuzz, the, the, the interview question used everywhere, right? You know, where the idea is you're going to be counting by integers, and if a number is divisible by 3, you say Fizz, and if it's divisible by 5, you say Buzz, and if it's divisible by 15, you say FizzBuzz. Right? And they ask you to write, implement the algorithm. And here it is. So what I did is I brought it into the repository here. So here is the algorithm as they specified it. I cleaned it up a little. Rather than do, uh, sorry, rather than do the, the weird the loop they did. Well, actually, I did do similar to that. At any rate, here's how I wrote it. It is a uh, range closed from 1 to 100, map them to object, which just converts from an integer to a string, and collect them into a list. If I'm using Java 17, you can just make that two list. Here's the from integer to string, which says if it's divisible by 3 or div and divisible by 5, then the string is fizz buzz, else if it's divisible by 3, fizz, else if it's divisible by 5, buzz, else it's the value of the string probably the nested ternary operators would be enough to make them reconsider giving you the job, right? You know. <laughs> but at any rate, that's the one he had on the home page. So here is the test on there. And you can see that it has a for all, and he threw in a divisible by 3. So this is a method to return just the numbers divisible by 3 using the arbitraries or the integers and a filter on it. And I also added in the divisible by 5 the same way. And then here is the property. Every fifth element ends with buzz. So I get the value and say, yeah, get the, here, it's, this is for all divisible by 5. 
get the value, I got an off by one I had to be careful about. And it should end with the word buzz, so that'll be the 15 as well. And then here's the one he added in, every number divisible by three started with the word fizz. And then I could just run the whole thing. Now the problem with this one is, although it's not really a problem, is that we only get 33 test cases because of those filters. So for what it's worth. And you can see it all passed. Uh, it did do all the, the generation for us. Now there are, oh, I think there was one other sample I was looking to show you. I think I did something with the Fibonacci numbers. You know, oh, I got a Fibonacci joke too. I don't know if you have any Fibonacci joke. The, apparently this year's Fibonacci conference is going to be as good as the last two combined. <laughs> yeah. I like that gag. At any rate, um, there was, uh, this was one of those cases where we have an iterative algorithm for Fibonacci numbers, right? It's so you could do your memoize capability and not have the uh, overflow that comes from a recursive algorithm. But this was something I saw in the Wikipedia page about Fibonacci numbers saying this is an approximation to the nth Fibonacci number. And I'm like, really? How good an approximation is that? And it didn't say. So I implemented the approximation Fibonacci by Binet. It's the mathematician Binet came up with it. Here's the one I know works. And if I do it iteratively, I'm not going to run out of memory. So I'm going to check the one I don't know by the one I do know. So the test says, this is a J unit parameterized test, so I could output the fib of whatever is whatever. And here's my ordered pairs to plug in for n and the result I'm expecting back. And I'll assert that fib by the Binet one is equal to the actual number. Now this is only going up to fib of 10. And that passed. They all came out OK. And then this one I tried to go into for all integers, but in range. So the range will be from, they say it in here. Oh, OK, it must be in the actual docs. The min, I believe, will be 1. And the max here I'm saying is 70. And I'll check them that way. And I think it worked up to 70. Yeah, and I think when I put in 71, it didn't work anymore. And it's almost certainly an integer overflow causing problems. And if I'd done big integer, I probably would have been OK. But I implemented it with integer. And then here was the full formula. So this is phi, the p plus q formula. This is yet another way of doing it. And again, you see how this property-based testing will tell you exactly where that works and what to do with it. OK? Now, there are more capabilities to this. It's a much bigger library that I'm talking about. Uh, the stateful testing, again, is in there. But I thought that's enough to give you the flavor of how it works. The, the links are in the, the uh, slides. But here's the user guide uh, that is very extensive, has lots of stuff in it. Then um, here is the API that has all the annotations in it. And then I already gave you the link for the GitHub repository. So I think that's plenty. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to hang out for a few minutes. But thank you very much for coming.